Young is a social commentator and campaigner. He's the director of the Free Speech Union, a membership organisation that stands up for the free speech rights of its members. Toby, can we look at the history of this um, assault, essentially, on free speech in Britain, but it's uh, also happening around the Anglophone world? Why is free speech coming under such assault at this point in history? Well, I think there are a number of factors. Um, I think it's um, uh, partly because um, the left used to champion free speech um, and are no longer doing so with quite the same enthusiasm because, for the most part, they're now in control. It was important for them to defend free speech when they were um, uh, the rebels um, because it, it enabled them to speak, to set out the case for socialism in the public square. Now that they've essentially won that argument across the West, defending free speech is no longer in their interests. And um, because they're in control, that means free speech is under attack. Um, I also think that the kind of um, coordinated assault on free speech by various government agencies, non-governmental agencies, um, commercial companies, universities, seemingly coordinating to try and suppress what they call misinformation, disinformation, hate speech on social media. I think that was prompted in part um, by a kind of visceral fear of the internet and um, uh, the the um, their 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 um, uh, marginalisation as the stewards of the you know uh, national conversation. Um, but I think in particular the triumph of Donald Trump in the presidential in 2016 and the triumph of Leave EU in the EU referendum in 2016 in the UK, the kind of global elite who felt very discombobulated by those populist revolts, um, they, they, their analysis, their post-mortem was, well, the reason we lost those debates is not because large sections of the electorates in America and the UK disagree with our agenda, don't share our values. It's not because there's actually quite a high price to be paid for the globalization agenda and it's been paid by ordinary people. No, their conclusion was the only possible explanation for why people could have voted for Trump or for Brexit is because they've been led astray, misinformed by bad actors, in some cases, bad state actors uh, on social media. So the way to address the, that that insurgency uh, was not to try and make the case for their agenda in the public square, not to try and persuade the public that globalization, for instance, was in their interest. Mass migration was something they should embrace, would ultimately bring about net benefits and so forth. No, the way to win the argument was to silence their critics by describing any criticism as misinformation, disinformation, or hate speech. And that's been successful in one respect in that um, uh, it's become much more difficult, I think, for people to speak their minds on social media without um, being kicked off, shadow banned, etc. But it's been unsuccessful insofar as it hasn't seemed to allay um, widespread popular dissatisfaction with the globalist agenda. I think we're about to see another of similar victories to the presidential and Brexit victories in 2016. And no doubt the international global elite will double down again and think that the only possible explanation for why they're losing elections is because of misinformation and disinformation and hate speech on the internet. Uh, but that, that clearly isn't working for them. So it'll be interesting to see what conclusion they eventually reach. You don't see a, a Labour government, an incoming Labour government, as um, likely to be any better uh, or worse? What? Um, how, how will they be different over all this business to do with white privilege and microaggressions, decolonisation, pronoun declarations, gender identity, blah, blah, blah? I think, I think um, a Labour victory will certainly make things worse. Um, first of all, I think that Labour will legislate to actually um, impose even more restrictions on speech. Um, the Law Commission of England and Wales three years ago um, uh, produced an oven-ready um, uh, hate speech in public order England and Wales bill, almost identical, if not slightly worse, 
than the Hate Speech and Public Order Scotland Act, which is wreaking such havoc in Scotland since it was activated on April 1st. Um, and the Free Speech Union and others managed to um, uh, avoid the Conservative Party embracing that legislation and introducing that bill. Uh, but uh, it, I'm sure it'll be only a matter of time before it's dusted off by Labour and brought back. And then we'll see very similar legislation to that which has been brought in in Scotland being brought in here. And as I say, I think it could be potentially worse. Um, but I think perhaps more importantly, Andrew, um, a lot of the diversity crats uh, are on the back foot, um, particularly um, those who are promoting the trans inclusion agenda. Um, you know, Britain's not known as Turf Island for nothing. Um, we've been winning a lot of those debates, um, uh, uh, but uh, and I think that has that that has inhibited the um, zeal of various enforcers of woke dogma in the workplace, in universities, in professional associations. They know that politically the government isn't completely on side, and that there are lots of an increasing number of organisations like the Free Speech Union out there pushing back, defending people's rights. Um, but I think they will be re-empowered by a, a, a big Labour victory at the next general election. They'll feel they have the wind in their sails again, and all the zeal which was beginning to fade will come flooding back. They'll feel again that they're on the right side of history and start persecuting people as a result. Um, full disclosure, I'm on the uh, Writers' Advisory Council of the Free Speech Union, very proud to be. Let's talk about this uh, Scottish Hate Crime Act. Um, 7,152 online hate reports only last week um, in the aftermath of the passing of that act, uh, which, of course, makes misgendering a, a criminal offence. If, uh, if you say a trans woman is a man or a trans man is a woman, uh, you can be arrested, can't you? Well, um, that was the fear, but um, uh, the law is extremely unclear. Um, even though it's called the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Act, hate isn't defined um, in the Act, uh, which grants Police Scotland um, a great deal of latitude about which hate crime reports they investigate and who they prosecute for allegedly um, uh, saying something hateful. And so far, they're, they're not going been... to be prosecuting J.K. Rowling, are they? Is that just because she's well, rich and very popular well, and is able I to think... take care of herself? Well, for the time being, they're not going to be prosecuting J.K. Rowling. I think they're they're going to wait for an extremely unsavoury um, example of someone who's broken this law, not you know a very successful middle class author with bags of money, but some. I probably working class football supporter um, who said something indefensible, um, at least in the public square. Um, they want to make, and they'll try and make an example of him. They'll want that person to be the first high profile prosecution under this new law. Once they then got away with that, they then, I think, might come for people like J.K. Rowling. But for the time being, um, they're not going to pick on her as the first person to prosecute because it would make it just seem absolutely ridiculous. And she, you know, she could defend herself extremely well. And what you do uh, at the uh, Free Spe Speech Union, so far 2,300 cases which have been processed by your support team. Um, you've been helping people since you founded it in the February of 2020. Uh, talk to us about, uh, tell us a few sort of stories essentially about, the, for example, the Simon Isherwood West Midlands Trains case or any other case that sort of springs to mind, something that's going on at the moment, something that you're particularly proud of. Tell us really what you do. Well, um, we do um, a number of things. Um, we're a membership organisation. We're not a charity. Um, and uh, although the membership dues are subsidised and not very expensive. And if one of our members gets into trouble um, because of something they've said, um, uh, particularly if it's something they've said which is patently lawful, um, but a breach of some workplace speech code, or not even a breach of a speech code, but just something that someone, some busybody, some snitch has complained about, um, we'll go to bat for them, um, including, if necessary, um, going to law. Um, and um, in those cases which have come to a conclusion, we've been successful 74% of the time. And as you say, we've fought 2,400 cases so far. Um, uh that's mainly what we do, but we also organise events, we publish briefing papers, we do a bit of lobbying, uh, we send out a weekly and monthly newsletter. Uh, but about 
a good 50% of what we do is actually helping our members fight their corner, defend them. Uh, and we have um, a four-person case team and a four-person legal team, and they're all working flat out. We currently have over 100 open cases, so we're extremely busy. Uh, and about a 1,000 people in Scotland have joined in the past couple of weeks because they're I worried. they have. About- <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're quite busy with our new Scottish members. Um, uh, but I'll tell you about one case in particular, which is um, our biggest victory to date. So um, a manager um, at uh, Lloyds Bank, who'd been employed by Lloyds Bank all his life, um, more than 25 years, called Carl Borgneal. Um, during lockdown, I think, he was asked to do uh, diversity training for the first time. So this is um, a white Englishman in his late 50s. Um, and um, he was told by this um, Ghanaian diversity trainer, who was a third party, she'd been employed by Lloyd's to produce this training. Uh, they, 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 were, they were told that um, you know, some words were just inappropriate to use in the workplace. And if anyone they were managing used those words, they should certainly report them um, and discipline them, if not fire them. And um, And he asked, I think very reasonably, isn't it context dependent? Um, so if one of my black employees uses a particular word about another black employee in conversation, um, that might be appropriate. Whereas for me to use that word about a black employee wouldn't be appropriate. And she claimed not to know what he was talking about and asked him to give an example. And even though she'd said at the very beginning of the training session, regard this as a safe space, you know, nothing you say is going to go beyond this room. You're not going to get into trouble. Let your inhibitions down, which, by the way, we always tell our members is a big red flag. Um, uh, Anyway, even though she said that at the beginning, in order to explain what he meant in the example he gave, he used the N-word. He didn't say the N-word. He actually used the N-word. And she was horrified, uh, didn't answer the question, and reported him to... She was the only person in this sort of session lots of employees in this session to report him, but she reported him to Lloyd's. Lloyd's placed him under investigation of gross misconduct and fired him. And um, happily, he was a member of the Free Speech Union. We were able to find him a really good legal team. Um, and uh, he won that case. And not only did he win uh, unfair on unfair dismissal, um, but he also won on discrimination because he had a disability, which contributed to uh, uh, the fact that he blurted out this word when under pressure in this in this in this session and he was awarded in total a uh, compensation of 800,000 pounds and that's our biggest victory to date congratulations on uh, on that tell me about Simon Isherwood the west midlands trains um story where he texted or uh, or put something out a tweet that he put out and you managed to uh, to save his, was, his job essentially to we, we've had we well, no, we've had two um west midlands trains employees actually andrew so the one you're referring to, I'll tell you about Simon Ishwood in a second, but the one you're referring to was Jeremy Sleep. And on um, Freedom Day, as Boris called it, I think it was um, June 19th, 2021, when all the lockdown restrictions were lifted, he said on his private Facebook account, thank God for that, I didn't want to live in an alcohol-free Muslim caliphate for the rest of my life. And um, <laughs> Which was obviously a joke. Obviously um, a joke. Uh, yes, but um, jokes and not don't a, work with the left do they they don't like jokes they don't. Or, or they pretend not to get them anyway yes, um, yeah no. one of his one of his sort of colleagues complained and he was investigated for gross misconduct and then fired and we went to bat for him and got a finding of unfair dismissal and he got a pretty decent compensation package um uh, uh, the Simon Isherwood, so that was a similar to the Carl Borgneal case, also an employee of West Midlands Trains. He too was in a an online diversity training session for the first time ever and was introduced for the first time to the concept of white privilege. And he thought it was errant nonsense. And um, at the end of the call, it was all on Zoom. He thought he disconnected one of those stories. And um, he set, turned to his wife and said, white privilege what a load of balls do you think they have black privilege in ghana or a black majority country um uh, and uh, because he said this even though no one complained i don't think um but the trainer overheard because he'd left his you know microphone on and hadn't disconnected and they complained he was fired we managed to win compensation for him too um it's ex- what's extraordinary is um you know 
how often employers, particularly public sector employers, go beyond the law. Um, they think that the law is on their side and that what someone has said because it's produced a complaint from someone with a protected characteristic is a breach of the Equality Act, not realising that the Equality Act also provides some protections for you know particular religions and beliefs and so forth. So they often go beyond the Equality Act, sometimes at the urging of activist organisations who deliberately misinterpret and gold plate the Equality Act. So they go beyond what's permissible by equalities law to punish people. Um, so you can often, you know, win by fighting back, particularly if your lawyers know more about equalities law than theirs. And it has become the uh, equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, it, it's become an industry, essentially, hasn't it? There are enormous amounts of um, of people employed in it. Uh, therefore, it's very much in their interest to to become which finder generals in this uh, in this sense. I saw the other day that the Royal Navy, a totally cash strapped organisation where we simply don't have enough ships or uh, or men, is spending two point five million pounds on uh, EDI stuff. I mean, it has to be insane in a in a country that isn't um, uh, properly defended um, in a maritime way, is it? mustn't it be? It's just absolutely insane um, and completely indefensible. Um, and, you know, the NHS is constantly advertising for equity, diversity and inclusion officers at vastly inflated salaries. And yet, you know, it, almost in the next breath, complain about Tory cuts, making it impossible to run the NHS. It's like, well, if you really are cash strapped, why are you creating these non-jobs and paying people these ridiculous salaries for doing them? Um, yeah, it has become an industry. I mean, I think in the US, it's an $8 billion a year industry. Last time I checked here, it's um, yeah, it's probably over a billion pound a year industry. Um, and um uh, one of the ironies is that um, it doesn't work. I mean, even if you even if you think that um, you know unconscious bias um, is actually a problem in British workplaces, including in the Royal Navy, um, you know, there's been quite a bit of research now that shows that if you give people unconscious bias training, um, uh, if you make them aware of their biases and get them to monitor them more carefully, um, they end up being more discriminatory, not less. Um, <laughs> the we classic law of unintended it, 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 consequences. It, 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 it was on that basis that um, that uh, the Cabinet Office uh, recommended that um, unconscious bias training be scrapped across Whitehall back in late 2020. Of course, nothing of the kind has happened. Um, but uh, we recently conducted a survey, Andrew, of um, 800 British workers. It was a representative sample of British workers taken from uh, across the board. Um, and it was done by a professional polling organisation. And uh, so it was, I think, a, you know, um, a, a reliable result. And we found that um, uh, not only is um, EDI training unpopular in the workplace, uh, but the people who like it least are precisely the people it's designed to help. So ethnic minorities, members of the LGBT community, they dislike it even more than the average worker. I think they find it patronising. They don't like uh, being portrayed as being weak and in need of protection agency. And they also don't like, you know, um, uh, the various solutions such as affirmative action, because then people suspect that they've only been employed because they tick a diversity box and not because they're actually qualified. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that we, we thought that was uh, a really useful finding. Now, there's nothing that you've said so far that would be disagreed with by any Tory I know, and I do know lots of uh, lots of Tories. And we have been in government, the Conservatives have been in government uh, since 2010. So how is it that in that period, this uh, billion-dollar industry, these extraordinary um, uh, uh, sort of culture change in Britain has uh, taken place. Why does it seem to be completely um, uh, unaffected by the fact that the people who are taking decisions in government and at cabinet level are um, conservatives who, as I say, agree with you? I think the explanation has to be that um, uh, since 2010, conservatives have been in office, but not really in power. Um, uh, you know, a good example is the Cabinet Office recommendation that unconscious bias training be scrapped across the civil service because it was counterproductive. Um, nothing happened in response to that. Uh, they didn't see to, they can make an announcement, you know, the, the equalities minister can say, 
please scrap this. It's useless. It's worse than useless. Uh, it's a waste of money. Um, uh, but they don't know which levers to pull. They're not really in charge. Um, and so nothing happened. And of course, you know, it's metastasized since then. Um, uh, and that, that seems to be true in general. I mean, one, one, perhaps it's it's been. I mean, that 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 might have been the case, even if the Conservatives had won a thumping majority in 2010. But certainly, one of the things that um, has empowered the deep state over the past, you know, 14 years is that um, for the successive Conservative-led administrations have been divided and quite weak. So we had a coalition government from what. 2010 to 2015, um, Cameron then won, but only won a small majority resigned after one year the vote leave team couldn't work out who should take over as pm so theresa may took over she was quite weak and ineffective she lost her conservative majority in 2017 we then had a minority government for two years boris then won a thumping majority and perhaps that was the moment when real change could have been affected but um uh to put the most charitable spin on it, um, he was um, derailed by the pandemic and that kind of consumed all his bandwidth and um, uh, beyond leaving the European Union um, and positioning us as staunch supporters of the Ukraine, he didn't do very much that you and I would have liked to have, like, liked him to have done. Um, uh, uh, and now, of course, he was defenestrated, replaced for a very short period by Liz Truss, who was then defenestrated too. And now we have, you know, uh, Rishi Sunak, who's um, uh, pretty weak source too. So I think it's 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 partly because the deep state is just very effective at entrenching and preserving its power, uh, no matter who's in charge, but also because the people in charge um, uh, haven't been terribly efficient or well organised or resolute about affecting real change. And I think uh, that was a lesson also from the first Trump administration. And it looks as though, you know, um, the second Trump administration will be more effective and they'll be better, wiser to the various um, wiles of the deep state for avoiding any kind of accountability or change. Um, we'll see. I think it's worth I think it's worth pointing out, not, not least because a lot of our listeners are uh, Americans, that the British deep state is very different from the American one, isn't it? You're not really talking about MI5 and MI6 um, that's uh, that's fighting these culture wars. You're talking about the um, unelected side of British um, uh, of the British sort of official world, the establishments essentially, the people who um, take uh, very important decisions over our lives. But um, are not, you're not alleging a kind of um, a conspiracy of, um, uh, of sort of sinister cabals there, are you? No, um, but I, I don't think it's always used in that way in the American context either. Um, uh, no, I think I mean, as you say, um, the unelected public officials um, who wield an enormous amount of power and whom it's very difficult to hold to account, not just in the civil service and uh, not just officers in local authorities, um, but also quangocrats, diversity crats, um, people at the kind of pinnacle of the kind of cultural economy who run the BBC, edit newspapers, um, uh, people at the top of academic institutions, opinion formers. Um, in, in the United Kingdom, maybe a little less so in America, it varies from state to state, but certainly here, for the most part, um, uh, that kind of... Uh, uh, the establishment is um, uh, very liberal, uh, very progressive, um, and not at all sympathetic to conservatives like us. Toby, it seems that there's a long way um, since we were undergraduates at Oxbridge 40 years ago that academia has gone um, towards the left, towards wokeism, towards a, a, a kind of um, much less... Uh, maybe I should say, a much more sort of collectivist approach to politics. Um, why is that? Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting you should say that, Andrew. I remember when I was an undergraduate at Brasenose College, Oxford, doing politics, philosophy and economics uh, from 83 to 86. Um, within my year, there were 10 of us doing PPE, and they ranged from an out-and-out -out fascist to a revolutionary communist with every shade in between. And then I went to Harvard as a Fulbright scholar the following year. Um, and uh, in the entire government 
department, which must have numbered more than 250 students, the only argument was between Rawlsian liberals and Nozickian liberals, two different types of liberalism. It was extraordinary. I mean, the homogeneity of thought within Harvard was really striking and a great contrast to Oxford. But I think Oxford has now become much more like Harvard. Um, and um, across the Anglosphere, there is, um, you know, conservatives are finding themselves an increasingly beleaguered minority at university, not just students, but faculty as well. Why is that? A um, number of things. Um, I think it, it's partly groupthink, isn't it? Um, I, I naively thought when I first went to university that the better educated someone was, the better read they were, the more intelligent they were, the more independent minded they'd be. But actually, more or less the opposite is the case, with some exceptions. Um, so the higher you go up the academic food chain, the more brilliant people appear to be, the more susceptible they are to the woke mind virus. Um, and um, that was really striking uh, during the imbroglio following the death of George Floyd, when one distinguished academic institution after another started issuing these kind of mea culpa statements. And they all used the same language. They all used phrases like, you know, it's past time we examined our own racism. We've been sweeping it under the carpet. Um, uh, and it's not enough just to be opposed to racism. You have to be anti-racist. They all It was as though they'd all been written by the same person. Um, and I thought as a joke, I would run some of the... So, so as soon as, you know, I don't know, the president of Yale issued one of these mea culpas, I would run it through the plagiarism software that's used to detect academic plagiarism. And I imagine it would kind of... The result it would spit out is that, well, this, this statement's almost identical to the one issued by the president of Harvard last week. And that one was very similar <laughs> to the one issued by the president of Yale the week before. And you could then, then, my plan was then to create a website seemingly created by a passionate supporter of BLM, accusing these university panjandrums of not being sincere about being anti racist because they were merely copying each other. And I imagine <laughs> that in response, they'd, they'd produce even more pious statements of fealty, you know, abasing uh, themselves at the altar of the woke church to prove just how anti racist they were. But I never actually got around to it, but I thought it would have been a good, a fun thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, uh, you've mentioned the Anglosphere several times now. Um, is it just a uh, Anglosphere thing? Do the French and Germans, Italians and Spanish not uh, have the same thing? Or do they have the same thing in a much uh, less virulent form? Well, um, it, it, interestingly, I think the the um, the woke mind virus um, uh, first went viral in the English speaking world. Uh, and that's because I think um, it's an American export. Um, and um, the mechanism by which it's exported is social media. And the first language of social media is English. Um, it also rhymes with the kind of non-conformism that um, is typical of the Anglosphere. Um, but uh, I think if, 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 you, if, if your country has a Catholic heritage and it's not English speaking, Spain, Italy, Greece, uh, maybe but, 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 not a, a more, a more a, a different kind of Christian heritage. Um, then you had antibodies, but um, those antibodies appear to have um, uh, 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 been been now overcome by the unstoppable woke mind virus, and it's now infecting France, for instance. People talk about le wokeism now in France. People in Italy and Spain also tell me that it's spreading in those countries to Portugal. Um, so I think they held out for a bit longer than us, but now they've also fallen. Tell us about uh, debanking and your your struggles with PayPal. There seems to be a really sinister aspect. Uh, also, of course, the way in which um, uh, Lloyd's tried to debank Nigel Farage, um, the uh, the Brexit leader. What's the what's the story there? And uh, should we be worried about this? Um, I think we should be worried about it. Um, so. As you say, I first encountered it when um, PayPal um, told me that they'd shut down not just my personal account, but the account of the Free Speech Union and the Daily Skeptic, this news publishing site I produce. Um, and they did all three within 15 minutes of each other. And I kicked up an almighty stink, got some MPs and peers to write to the Treasury Select Committee. And um, eventually my accounts were all restored, but other people haven't been so lucky. Um, but I think what we're beginning to see, and as you say, Nigel Farage lost his account at Coots. Um, and you know, there have been a number of people who've been debanked seemingly for purely political reasons. And Trudeau 
did this in Canada with uh, people supporting um, the truckers protesting about lockdown. Um, uh, what we're seeing, I think, across the West is the emergence of an embryonic westernized form of the Chinese Communist Party's social credit system, whereby if you dissent publicly, if you challenge woke orthodoxy, um, you can you are now at risk of losing your access to financial services, which for many people is completely devastating. Another thing we're seeing across the uh, West at the moment and have done since the 7th of October is this huge rise in anti-Semitism. Is there a argument with regard to freedom of speech that um, cries like from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, that one hears at demonstrations, um, essentially equate to incitement to violence and therefore shouldn't be allowed? Or would you defend their right to, to shout that slogan at uh, demos? Well, I think my um, guiding principle here is the principle enshrined in a famous Supreme Court case, Brandenburg versus Ohio, um, where the principle set out was that um, something should be permitted unless it's likely to lead to imminent lawless action. Um, and that is actually um, an American version of the old English common law principle that you should be permitted to say more or less what you like in the public square, provided it's not going to lead to a breach of the peace. So the question there, I think, is, is the chanting of slogans like from the river to the sea likely to lead to a breach of the peace? And I think in most cases it isn't. So I would tolerate it. Of course, I don't like it. Um, I'm passionately on the side of Israel in this particular conflict and every conflict come to that. Um, but um, uh, nevertheless, I think uh, if you are a defender of free speech, you have to hold your nose and defend people's right to say that just as, you know, let's suppose Jeremy Corbyn had won the general election in 2019, which I think we're going to get on to talk about, um, uh, he probably would have declared the IDF a prescribed terrorist organisation by now, and anyone out on the streets uh, chanting their support of Israel or chanting bring them home about the hostages might be, you know, might be, might find themselves in the same hot water as some of the people chanting from the river to the sea, although none of them have in fact got into hot water. But so, so I think, you know, it's beh it, it behooves us as defenders of free speech to hold our nose and defend people's right to chant that, provided it's not going to lead to an imminent breach of the Peace. Ditto Holocaust denial. Yes, I don't. I'm not a, a great believer in criminalising Holocaust denial or genocide denial of any kind. Um, I think far better to let people set out their um, uh, ridiculous. Uh, beliefs in the public square so they can be properly rebutted with evidence and reason. That is the counter speech principle also um, uh, enshrined in a famous Supreme Court decision. Um, for some reason, the West has abandoned the principle of counter speech in the past 15 years. And to remind you, uh, that principle is that the best way to counter bad speech, false speech, is not to try and silence it, but to uh, c uh, uh, rebut it with more and better speech. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. I think that applies to all genocide denial. And are we therefore, because so few people um, seem to at least publicly agree with you, and because we are in this world of EDI, are we not in a dangerous moment where um, the Enlightenment itself and the concept of meritocracy, which uh, the word of which um, was coined by your own father, um, Michael Young, are at um, a dangerous tipping point. Do you? Am, am I going um, completely over the top here by by worrying about whether the concept of meritocracy and the Enlightenment can survive this onslaught, whereby all issues are seen through the colour of um, race, sex, and uh, and all the other um, the other ones, rather than on their own inherent rational. Um, and logical um, uh, senses? Yeah, well, that's the $6 million question. Um, I'm an optimist, um, and I think that um, the pendulum um, of identity politics has reached its um, peak and is, is we're just seeing the beginnings of a swing back the other way. Um, uh, peak woke. Um, I mean, I'm a bit hesitant to declare peak woke because I've been declaring peak woke more or less at every free speech 
anniversary party. Um, I announced on stage that we've reached peak woke, only for things to get worse by an order of magnitude <laughs> over the next 12 months. It's like <laughs> falling through a building, uh, you know, a collapsing building. Every time you think you've hit rock bottom, the floor gives way again and you're falling again. Um, uh, but I do think, I do now think um, there are sufficient signs to indicate that uh, we have reached the peak of this particular mania no doubt it'll be replaced by other manias but this particular one seems to be finally running out of steam um, okay you know, what, what are these sorry tell us what are these signs get, get, let well, us be optimistic tell us a few okay. signs um we, in in the uk um we've seen um a great pushback um against um uh uh, trans rights activists um, said so the NHS has now finally um, announced it will no longer prescribe puberty blockers. Um, one of our gender identity clinics has just been shut down. Um, you know, we're known now across the world as Turf Island because the turfs have largely been victorious in that particular battle. And that's huge because um, uh, Trans rights activists, along with their fellow social justice warriors, claim that they are on the right side of history. That's one of their most powerful arguments. That's a, a, a rhetoric which worked for communism for many decades, and it's now worked for the woke uh, cultists as well. But um, if they suffer a colossal setback, which they have, I think, in this case, um, uh, it begins to look as though they're not on the right side of history and their victory isn't inevitable. So at that point, the whole house of cards, I think, begins to crumble. But you can see it with... Um, uh, uh, the failure of um, uh, woke in the entertainment industry, the failure of various Disney films, um, the attempt to, you know, create various um, trans and gay and female Marvel superhero characters. You know, there's no public appetite for any of this stuff. And it looks as though, you know, Trump's going to win the next presidential election. Though I do worry, Andrew, that um, just as um, Trump's first victory in 2016 seemed to um, uh, 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 fill you know, the woke with a kind of uh, almost religious zeal and fervor. So his victory this year might act as a sort of defibrillator to the corpse of woke and bring it kind of roaring back to life. But I hope not. Uh, I think we are. I think I think I, I begin to see most of these things um, are cyclical. Um, I think there's probably um, the West, the Enlightenment tradition, ideas like meritocracy have still got enough going for them to persuade you know the next generation to defend them. You know, you're beginning to see that too amongst younger people. Polling indicates that amongst you know under eighteen year olds, um, uh, there's there's beginning to be a kind of rejection of this kind of liberal authoritarianism. Uh, everyone telling them what to do all the time. I mean, if you're a teenager, you have anything about you at all? Of course, you're going to reject it. So, I I'm reasonably optimistic. Good, and let's all hope that people recognise that the uh, whole idea of there being a right or a wrong side of history is is a, a Whig or a determinist or a Marxist concept and not one that a sensible person, let alone a sensible historian, should ever believe in. Um, Toby, what is the uh, history book or, or biography or anything to do with history, really, um, the book that you're reading at the moment? Well, um, I'm, I've, I've just got through... Um, uh, more or less the entire uh, collected works of Bernard Cornwall. So I've oh, um, I just fantastic. finished reading the um, uh, his trilogy. Is it a trilogy? I think a trilogy about the American Civil War. That was extremely good. I've read all the sharp novels. I've read the one set in um, Arthurian England. Um, I've read the one set um, around the Battle of Agincourt. And um, actually, I hadn't. I didn't read them in the correct chronological order, which I should have done, uh, because actually that's a great way of um, of acquainting yourself with the history of England. Um, but uh, I feel if I can sort of piece it together um, that I'm now I now I've now been immersed in English history really for the past couple of years as I've been plodding my way through with with much delight I should say his entire <laughs> oeuvre. All, all, all the Peninsula War ones, um, the Sharp uh, novels, did you say, and the yes. Waterloo novel? Fantastic. Yep. He's a very nice man, actually, uh, Bernard. He's a he's as well as being somebody who, needless to say, has done an enormous amount of uh, work in history. It's interesting how historical novelists, um, Michael Grant in the Ancient World, of course, Georgette Heyer and C. S. Forrester in the Napoleonic Wars, are very often able to give you insights um, that uh, that you wouldn't get otherwise. I, I'm a great believer in people reading historical novels in order to understand more about history. What's your what if, your counterfactual? 
Well, the counterfactual, which I alluded to earlier, is well, what if Jeremy Corbyn had won the general election in 2019 instead of Boris? I, mean, I, 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 I campaigned for Boris. I was a great believer in Boris, disliked Jeremy Corbyn, intensely thought he would have been an absolute disaster. But I now think, actually, um, given the poison chalice of the pandemic, which seems to have toxified almost every uh, government that was in power when it struck, um, it might have we might have been better off if Corbyn had been left to deal um, with that particular parcel, um, uh, that ticking bomb, and not Boris. Um, uh, and at the moment, because the Tories have now been in power more or less for 14 years, because we've been through a succession of leaders in quite quick succession, um, uh, it looks as though... Keir Starmer, Jeremy, Cor- Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn's successor, is going to win, you know, a super majority, and the Tory party may 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 not even exist after the next general election. So badly are they going to do? Uh, whereas if Corbyn had won in twenty nineteen, I mean, we would have, would have had a bad five years, but we'd now be looking at actually the probability that the Tories would win a super majority, not Labour. So I think actually we might have been better off had Corbyn won that election. This is tragic. I've agreed with everything you've said up until now, but I just can't <laughs> accept that. Not only would Corbyn have used the pandemic to uh, to institute massive tax rises, huge extra powers of the state. He would have used it to uh, crush all opposition and be able to argue that anybody who opposed him was uh, was trying to help the pandemic. But also he'd have been um, prime minister when um, uh, Ukraine was invaded and he wouldn't have given any support whatsoever in the way that we did early on and, and usefully and, and lethally, as it turned out, to poor old Zelensky. So I'm not going to go along with you with this, uh, with this, okay. um, <laughs> uh, with this uh, um, counterfactual. Um, Toby Young, thank you very much indeed for coming on Secrets of uh, Statecraft and uh, good luck with the Free Speech Union, which is, uh, is a really first class organisation. Thank you very much, Andrew.